Hey guys, welcome back to another Small Engines Questions and Answers. It's been a while since I made a video. That's because I've been so busy. So I've managed to get a bit of time and make one today. And I also want to welcome all my new subscribers and I want to thank all those who regularly comment under my videos. Sorry if I can't get all your comments. It's just, it's very hard to do that. If I missed your comment, send it back again. And hopefully on the second time around, I'll be able to answer your question. We're currently in the winter season here in Muskoka, Ontario, Canada, and we do not have any snow on the ground, which is very unusual for this time of year in this part of Canada. And here's behind my shop, here are my sheds, and you can see there's not even a flake of snow on the ground. I know the snow will come, it's just very odd at this time of the year to see no snow on the ground. I'm going to get right into the first question I'm going to answer today, and that is, do you ever get frustrated when you work on small engines? Well, my definite answer to that is yes. Sometimes you get some stuff that goes really well, you don't hit too many snags, but then you'll get some old piece of junk, and it's one problem after another, and it's just very hard to diagnose sometimes. And when things are hard to diagnose, that's when a lot of time is wasted. Also, you may fix something to get it running. For example, you get the engine running on a piece of equipment just to find out that the transmission doesn't work or that you have other problems. That can be very frustrating, and it can be a total waste of time, and I have to say, yes, some days I do get upset, but I try not to let it get to me too much. Sometimes I just leave that piece of equipment there and move on to something else that I know that I'll have better success. Then the next day I'll come back to that other piece of equipment that was making me frustrated. So it's absolutely normal that you're going to feel that way some days. Some days you may not even be able to accomplish anything. You may just hit one snag after another and everything you work on is just not worth fixing. Or you may run into problems that are much bigger than you anticipated. That's why you have to be very cautious if you're going to give some kind of estimate to people. And especially when you're working on very old equipment like this one here, the potential for these snags to come up or major problems is quite real. For example, on this snowblower here, the engine does not run, so it may be hard to tell somebody that everything else will be okay unless you can see the engine running first. You could spend a lot of time and money fixing that engine only to find out that the transmission isn't working. And sometimes on really old equipment like this, it may be hard to even find the parts to fix it. So definitely you're going to need a lot of patience if you want to work on small engines. Sometimes people ask me, is it bad to leave my equipment outside? What can happen to it if I do that? Well, this one here was left outside. Here's the carburetor bowl taken out of it. You can see it's all corroded. It's the same thing inside the carburetor as you can see here. And water probably went right inside the carb as well. Another thing that can happen by having equipment sit outside like this is that water can actually get right inside the engine. And if you go to use it again, it's going to be seized. If it's not seized, you may have some damage inside from rust as well. Now, if you do leave your equipment outside, make sure it's covered with something that will allow air to go in between the parts. Or in other words, let it breathe. If you tarp it up really tight with plastic or tarp, it may not breathe, it's going to sweat and cause problems as well. Another problem that I see often when people leave stuff outside is that all the mechanisms are seized. And that could include the mechanisms inside the transmission as well. And sometimes even the recoil will be seized. And also if you have a carburetor like on this one, it's no guarantee that after you clean it, that it's going to run. You may actually have to replace the whole carb, which can be very expensive. And in most cases, it's not worth fixing the machine at that point. And while I'm on the topic of carburetors, if you do have a dirty carb, you clean it, you even put it into an ultrasonic cleaning machine, and the engine still surges, my recommendation is to replace the whole carburetor with a new one. A question I got from somebody here the other day in the shop is, if I hear metal grinding in the transmission of my snowblower, what can be going wrong? Well, I've actually saved parts from a snowblower that was experiencing that same problem. And here's what happened. The drive disc or plate here is all chewed from this drive wheel. What happened to this drive wheel is that the drive ring, the rubber ring, came right off. The grooves on the plate are quite deep. It's made of aluminum. And this part here is damaged as well. It should be higher. If you try to put a rubber ring in there now, it may actually come off again. So the lesson here today, guys, is if you hear any noise inside the transmission of your snowblower that does not sound normal, just check it immediately to make sure you're not running metal on metal with some parts that should have the rubber ring on. The rubber ring here is not expensive to replace, but these parts here are very expensive to replace. 
Another question I often get from people is, how do you know what size of drill bit to use when you're going to install a helicoil? Well, if you don't have a kit like this that includes the right bit for every helicoil you're going to use, you can actually go online and download a chart that's going to give you all the proper sizes of drill bits to use for each specific helicoil. I like buying these kits with everything included because it's very quick when you go to use it. You don't have to guess or do any research. Everything's there. If you break the bit, you just simply replace it in the kit. And if you look closely on your bits, it will give you the size of them. And the same procedure applies if you're just drilling and tapping and not putting in helicoils. You can download a chart like this and it gives you all the proper sizes to use. I bought these sets here at Princess Auto here in Canada for a very good price. These are the standard sizes and I also have a metric box like this as well. I've actually done a video review on both of my kits. I'm going to put the link under the video today so you can go watch it. And by the way guys, if you're serious about repairing small engines, I do recommend that you have some kind of helicoil kit in your shop like this. The next thing I'm going to show you is an almost brand new chainsaw that's been damaged quite severely. So basically I'm going to show you this chainsaw and I'm going to show you why this happened. As you can see here, this is a steel MS-291C. It's in almost brand new condition. I don't even think that the engine is broken in yet. But if I turn it around, you can see major damage here where the clutch is, or was. It's all melted on part of the body of the chainsaw. The oil pump is damaged. Even the oil line is damaged inside here. So people have been asking me what's caused this problem. Well, what's happened is that the owner apparently ran it with the chain brake engaged. The clutch on this thing got so hot that it melted the cover here that goes right there. And the cost to repair this is quite extensive, so the gentleman just decided to buy a new chainsaw. Now the brake does still work. This saw here would be quite expensive to repair. So at this point here, I'm just going to hold on to it. Maybe I will fix it in the future, or I'm just going to keep it for parts. So the lesson today, guys, is to make sure that you do have some basic knowledge of chainsaw operation before you use one and before you go and buy yourself a new one. And for my last tip today, guys, I want to show you this awesome product. It's a silver grade anti-seize in a spray can. You just spray it on, it gets into spots where you can't get it with a paintbrush out of the can. And I use this quite a bit in the shop. You can buy this at Burfasco or other industrial stores. And here's the product number here. I even spray the stuff in the tie straps that I use to tie equipment in my trailer or my pickup. With the salt and the bad weather we get here in the winter time, this stuff here on my straps keeps them from seizing. So that'll be it for today's Q&A guys. Make sure to follow me on Facebook, Google+, Twitter and Instagram and have yourselves a great weekend.